Welcome to America's Cannabis Conversation, where you can hear experts from all facets of the cannabis business as to what's happening in this exploding industry. Keep yourself informed. Join the conversation. Welcome. This is Dan Perkins for your American Cannabis Conversation midweek update. Washington, D.C. McConnell slams Pelosi over claim marijuana is a proven therapy amid coronavirus debate. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican of Kentucky, took a shot at House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Democrat of California, on this past week, criticizing recent comments she made defending marijuana provisions that were included in her chamber's latest coronavirus relief legislation. The Majority Leader, who has consistently rallied against the inclusion of cannabis banking protections in the House COVID-19 bill, said on the Senate floor that Pelosi is still agitating for strange new special interest carve-outs for the marijuana industry and even claiming that they are COVID related. She said that with respect to the virus, marijuana is a therapy that has proven successful. You can't make this up, he said. I hope she shares her breakthrough with Dr. Fauci, McConnell Wiley added, referring to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease Director Anthony Fauci, who has been helping to lead the White House coronavirus task force. Down the hall in the nation's capital, top House Democrat talks marijuana reform with major can- with major cannabis company. A top House Democrat said during a recent interview with a major marijuana company that small farms could benefit from growing cannabis to offset losses in the tobacco industry. And he argued that the Democrats' view to decriminalize marijuana as a priority in policy reform discussions. Majority Whip James Clyburn, Democrat of South Carolina, George Canopy Growth David Culver for a new series the company launched called Under the Canopy last week. And the pair discussed a wide range of marijuana issues. Notably, the former chair and current member of the Congressional Black Caucus said the group considers decriminalization of cannabis a big, big issue in the context of policy reform. Most of this is generational like anything else, but it carries the day. Decriminalization carries the day in the caucuses, he said. I think that when you look at decriminalization, I think these issues are majority issues with the Congressional Black Caucuses. And I think it's also the same with our House Democratic Caucus. Apparetta, Georgia. Women who use marijuana more often have better sex, a study says. Among women who enjoy marijuana, there is no shortage of anecdotal evidence that adding a bit of cannabis can bring a thrill to the bedroom. And in states where the drug is legal, marketers have capitalized on this claim. THC-infused lubricants promised increased arousal and better orgasm. And some sexual health advocates have built entire careers on cannabis-enhanced intimacy. But is there anything behind the hype? While researchers are still trying to tease out the precise relationship between cannabis and sex, a growing body of evidence indicates the connection itself is very real. The latest study, which asked women who use marijuana about their sexual experiences, found that more frequent cannabis use was associated with heightened arousal, stronger orgasms, and greater sexual satisfaction in general. Our results demonstrate the increasing frequency of cannabis use in associated with improvement of sexual function and is associated with increased satisfaction, orgasm, and sexual desire in a new study published last week by the Journal of Sexual Medicine. Department of Veterans Affairs. Cannabis investor involved in a shady coronavirus mass deal, industry insider claims. In late April, as the escalating pandemic shut down most of the country and the federal government shelled out billions, if not trillions of dollars, to untested contractors for protective masks, Juanita Ramos got a call from a friend in the marijuana business. Her friend and some other entrepreneurs were buzzing all over about the huge payday. They had in their possession a $34.5 million purchase from the United States Department of Veterans Affairs. A contractor hired by the VA to provide 6 million N95 respirators to the nation's largest hospital system had searched for weeks but found none of the potentially life-saving masks. So he reached out far and wide for help, offering to cut in anyone who could help him finance, purchase, and deliver the masks by a deadline. His PO, as is customarily called, 
had made its way to players in the cannabis industry where deals are made quickly and often in cash. A friend asked Ramos, did she want in the, on the action? Ramos had modest connections in the medical supply chain through her work in legal marijuana and thought perhaps she could help terrified healthcare workers get urgently needed protective gear while also pocketing a little extra cash. Ramos, 66, enlisted her daughter, Dawn, 50, and both hit the phones, calling moneyed folks they knew in the marijuana business. Marijuana retailers operating in a no man's land between the state legalization and the conflicting federal law often get financing outside of traditional banks from private equity firms and wealthy individuals. A famous example from the before time last fall, two indicted Soviet-born businessmen working for President Donald Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, tried to finance a pot business from the cash from Romanian investors. In the marijuana space, Ramos thought there are people with deep pockets who can move money around fast, avoiding the hang-ups that might slow such an urgent purchase. It's quick money, Ramos said. And the broker game in marijuana and industrial hemp is exactly the same. For working the phones, Ramos and her daughter said they made only about $200. But their experience and the records they kept tell a cautionary tale for hospitals, agencies, and schools that are still scouring for masks ahead of the potential second wave of the coronavirus. This has been Dan Perkins with your America's Cannabis Conversation Midweek Update. Welcome back to the conversation today. And today we have Morgan Fox from the American Cannabis Industry Association. And I invited Morgan to come on and talk about what happened when the Democratic Platform Committee, uh, by almost a two to one vote, decided not to discuss anything in the Democratic platform about deregulation of cannabis and decriminalization about cannabis. So, Morgan, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me again. So let's let's talk about the issue. The Democrats, uh, which prior to this most recent event, seemed to be pretty much in favor of uh, uh, they passed the, the safe banking bill and they're talking about wanting to um, decriminalize and, uh, and deal with cannabis. They, they did kind of a, a 180 at the platform committee. Can you give us some insight as to what happened? Well, the, uh, unfortunately, the Democratic uh, National Convention decided to uh, really kind of roll back their, uh, their position on cannabis. Uh, I wouldn't call it a 180, but it's definitely a, a slight decrease in strength from where it was last year and uh, are basically promoting now decriminalization and rescheduling as opposed to descheduling and regulation, uh, which is obviously disappointing. Um, still a step in the right direction in some areas and a, uh, a big step backwards in others, particularly when it comes to rescheduling, which would be incredibly harmful uh, for reasons that we've discussed on previous shows. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, I don't think that this is necessarily a uh, really big cause for alarm per se. Um, I think really what was happening is that um, the committee, as well as including some uh, Democratic lawmakers, really wanted the party's position and platform to be in lockstep with uh, that of uh, the presumptive nominee, Joe Biden, um, who, while you know, still has a pretty imperfect idea of what marijuana policy should be in this country, has uh, definitely moved in the right direction since beginning his campaign and we feel is uh, open to further evolution on this uh, idea. Um, I don't think that the fact that the uh, um, party platform uh, was pulled back a little bit is indicative of any change in the appetite of Democratic lawmakers in Congress for descheduling and passing something uh, comprehensive like the Moore Act, um, I, you know, including uh, Representative Barbara Lee, who is and continues to be a champion for uh, cannabis policy reform on the Hill. Um, you know, even though she voted no, I really think that this was purely a, uh, a political move on the DNC's part to match up with uh, Biden's position. I am very confident that we will consider, uh, continue to see Democratic lawmakers pushing for uh, making cannabis legal at the federal level and removing it from the Controlled Substances Act, uh, regardless of the party platform. Do you think there's a possibility that this could backfire, especially if the Democrats uh, lose control of the House and uh, 
no longer control the agenda. If some Republicans control the House, the Senate, and the White House, um, what happens to those people? When we talked in the pre-show, you were talking about some people who had been supporters of uh, all the things that you wanted to get done um, turned their back on you and uh, and went along with, quote, the party line. But if they lose their power, um, does that have an onerous situation towards the industry? Uh, well, first of all, I did not say that they had turned our back on us. I think that this was simply a uh, political concession. Um, if people were pulling their names off of bills as sponsors, that would be another story. But we're not seeing that at all. Uh, we're seeing uh, continued pressure from uh, Democratic lawmakers to uh, enact some sort of uh, comprehensive cannabis policy reform, as well as small reforms, such as the Safe Banking Act. Um, right. you know, I don't think that the DNC's uh, uh, platform is going to lead to the, uh, you know, the Democrats losing uh, the House. Um, I think that it's possible that it might slow their, or you know, decrease their chances of gaining some more seats. Um, and if anything, I think that it might just soften some of the support for uh, uh, candidate Biden. Uh, but that being said, I think that it, what really matters is uh, where lawmakers have been standing on this issue. Um, you know, if Republicans end up taking the House, I think it's anybody's guess as to what will happen. Uh, there is bipartisan support for comprehensive change, uh, but increasingly the bills that have been backed by Democrats are starting to see less Republican support simply because of uh, partisan rancor. Um, I think that we can still see some uh, progress even in a uh, you know an all Republican uh, Congress. Uh, it might not be as fast as we would like it to, but as we're seeing from uh, polling as well as from behavior in a number of votes on smaller issues, that there is Republican support for reform. Yeah, I saw a recent uh, survey conducted by Rasmussen, which I followed for years, and uh, it was remarkable because it was they even reported that it was the the first time they've ever seen this that the that the majority of people who are being polled by them when asked the question about retaining your existing representation in Congress, over 60% are not happy with the people that are representing them in Congress today. And so um, if that's the case, you, you could find yourself in a situation where there could be a huge turnover one way or the other in, in the House and control, and, and more than just tacit control, um, uh, a significant uh control given to the Republicans um, and people who are who have been supporters the I think the number uh, uh, Morgan is something like 93 percent of incumbents win re-election and and we're talking over 60 percent of, of voters don't like the incumbents where they are so y we could be seeing ourselves with a potentially a significant turnover in Congress and in the leadership in the Congress, uh, perhaps on both parties, uh, that there'll be a, a total difference. And to, so do you have a sense of anything about the candidates who are already been identified that are running what their positions might be on cannabis? Uh, well, I think that the dissatisfaction that voters are seeing is having a much bigger impact in primaries than it's going to have in the general election. Uh, while people might, might not be happy with incumbents, I often I don't think that it's really enough to get them to switch parties in uh, when it comes to many um, congressional seats. So I really don't think that we're going to see all that much of a shift. Um, and any shifts that we do see, I think, are really going to be uh, at the primary level, as I said, and um, drifting more towards uh, – uh, people that might have uh, somewhat more extreme views. And, you know, what we're seeing is that, at least on the Republican side, that um, they're, you know, uh, regardless of uh, people's general issue views or uh, how far along they are on the uh, you know, very fuzzy political spectrum, that support for cannabis policy reform is growing in that demographic. Um, and what we're seeing on the Democrat side is that incumbents are being replaced by people who have uh, even more progressive views on cannabis policy than they do. Uh, so I don't think it's necessarily cause for alarm, uh, particularly since if you look at the general uh, voting public, uh, this issue continues to gain support year after year and has more support than almost any candidate in any uh, race. So um, really, I think what we're looking at more is that candidates that want to get some more uh, support at the polls 
will be increasingly embracing comprehensive cannabis policy reform. Yeah. You know, it's um, in looking at, at the issue, um, uh, there's, there's so much going on um, with, uh, we, we basically have about what, four weeks left uh, theoretically with the, with the campaign season starting with Labor Day. Uh, is there much, any, is there much going to be accomplished on the agenda between now and November and what about after November? What, what's what's the industry? What is your industry association thinking about? What what's possible and what's not possible to get accomplished? Well, in terms of Congress, uh, we're still uh, very optimistic about the possibility of passing some sort of uh, banking reform, um, both in the uh, appropriations bills that are coming up. Although that might not even be settled until after the elections, given the pace that Congress has dealt with appropriations issues in previous years. Uh, but also through a uh, coronavirus uh, stimulus package. Um, now, we still haven't seen what the Senate has come up with for that package or whether or not it includes cannabis policy or uh, banking, but uh, there are other avenues to pursue after it, uh, um, if they do not include that, um, to have it put back in into a, a coronavirus stimulus package. So uh, we're pretty hopeful about that. And then uh, things will pretty much be on hold in terms of standalone bills until after the election. Uh, but it's entirely possible that standalone non-coronavirus related uh, legislation could be taken up uh, post-election. So uh, that's something we've got our fingers crossed for and are going to continue working with lawmakers to uh, push and uh, build support um, regardless of what vehicle is used uh, for that. Um, in terms of more comprehensive reform, uh, there have been some rumors about trying to uh, uh, renew a push for the more act at the end of the year. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's anybody's guess whether that will actually happen and how successful it would be, uh, whether or not it would carry us next year. But I think that that's something that's probably more likely to be addressed in the, uh, the next congressional session. There seems to be a little bit of a dust up between Pelosi and, um, and her position on cannabis funding in the, uh, the the stimulus bill and Mitch McConnell, um, he, um, he he doesn't seem to support that in the Senate. So is that going to be off the table in a compromise, or what do you think? I think a lot of that is just politicking. Um, you know, and uh, really, McConnell has uh, more specifically pointed out a uh, diversity study that's attached to the uh, the House version of the Safe Banking Act as being a major sticking point, uh, but. The issue of overall cannabis uh, banking reform, I don't think is something that's completely off the table for the Senate. Um, and I think a lot of the uh, the rancor that has gone on are really just uh, posturing, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, we see okay. from uh, you know a lot of a lot of uh, uh, GOP lawmakers tweets uh, keep talking about how many times uh, marijuana is mentioned in the uh, stimulus bill, and it's it's a non-starter talking point. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, cannabis banking reform is directly related to uh, uh, COVID-associated issues, uh, whether that be uh, you know, job protection and job creation, uh, generating tax revenue, uh, uh, all the way down to direct uh, public health and safety issues in terms of not having to handle cash and being able to uh, enforce social distancing and limit close proximity in-person transactions. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of I, I agree with you. There's a lot of discussion about uh, one of the ways to help the economy is to is to expand the sale of cannabis products, especially on the recreational side, in terms of putting people to work and um, and generating tax revenue for the states that desperately need tax revenue. Unfortunately, uh, Morgan, we're just about out of time, so I'd like you to just take a moment and tell people how they can follow your association and follow what you do. Well, uh, we're the National Cannabis Industry Association, and you can reach us at thecannabisindustry.org. We're also available on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Thank you for joining us today, Morgan. Thanks for having me. And we'll be right back. You're listening to America's Cannabis Conversation on W420RadioNetwork.com. Your new cannabis electronic checking account can offer you pin secure credit and debit cards for your clients. 
we can place a cashless ATM at your checkout counter, which reduces the amount of cash on hand. Did you know that we can help you bring legacy cash into your new cannabis electronic checking account? No more paying with cash. Making payments with your electronic check is safe and secure. So if you find yourself up at night worrying about somebody breaking in and stealing your cash, consider a cannabis electronic checking account. To find out if a cannabis electronic checking account is right for you, call 888-420-8884 and ask for Dan Perkins. That's 888-420-8844. W420radionetwork.com Welcome back to the conversation. And joining us today is uh, your first visit with Mike Regan, who is going to be a regular on the program, uh, talking about one of the things that I love to talk about, and that is investing in the cannabis space and investing in general. I've had him on the show before. He's very articulate, and I'm thrilled with the opportunity to have him come on and be a regular on investing on America's Cannabis Conversation. So welcome, Mr. Mike Regan. Oh, thanks, Dan. It's uh, good to be here, and I'm uh... Excited to be uh, talking with uh, your listeners regularly. So let's just, just start off and, and let's give the audience a quick thumbnail of who is Mike Regan. Tell us about you and about your experience. Uh, sure. Well, uh, in terms of me, I'm basically an experienced uh, professional investor so uh, who has now gone from covering you know, traditional companies and traditional businesses to applying you know, the lessons and skills learned from those traditional businesses to analyzing and investing in the cannabis sector. Uh, in terms of my background, uh, most recently I was at uh, MJ Biz Daily as a financial analyst there uh, on an uh, investor intelligence service, which uh, they've since discontinued the subscription service, and I'm uh, relaunching it myself uh, at my website, mjresearchco.com, uh, where I'll be, you know, getting that service uh, back up and running to you know, provide premium content, uh, you know, premium investment analysis to, uh, to paying subscribers with some free content as well. In terms of my background, before I was at MJ Biz Daily, uh, I basically had been uh, doing long, short equity investing at a couple different hedge funds, uh, primarily. Rube Capital, which is a small cap, uh, long short uh, hedge fund with uh, more of a growth strategy, and um, before that, uh, Hawkshaw Capital, which uh, was a long short small cap uh, equity hedge fund that had more of a value strategy. So I actually have both experience in value and growth investing. Uh, and that's the bulk of my 20-year career. I started way back uh, in the internet bubble covering uh, cable and satellite mm. over at uh, Donaldson, Lufkin, and Genret, uh, which then bought, was bought by Credit Suisse, so that was a Credit Suisse, and then the team jumped over to Deutsche Bank, uh, so it was basically the same job, just I kept getting new business cards. Uh, yeah. That was, you know, had sort of a front row seat with the internet spike and then pop and then resurgence. Um, so that's, that's actually something I, I think is sort of, uh, I'm hearing a lot of echoes to that, uh, as I look at the cannabis space now where you have sort of a, a, a broad macro theme, you know, it's like a multi-decade freight train investable theme, but it kind of got ahead of itself and then it comes crashing back down and then, but that theme is still there if you can pick the right companies to invest in it. Um, before, you know, in terms of my education, I was, uh, uh, Georgetown undergrad and a uh, uh, MBA in finance from MIT, um, and uh, and I had a couple of stints uh, in. Uh, I was briefly doing sort of corporate strategy work over at Liberty Mutual, um, but that's basically that's essentially my career in a nutshell. So what I'm trying to do now mm -hmm. is, you know, at those hedge funds, I was basically a generalist analyst. So I covered uh, companies. You know, and accurately invested in them uh, in the you know consumer, industrial, media, tech, telecom, energy, commodity extraction, financial, REITs, um, pretty much everything except you know biotech investing. 
I've, I've basically invested in that in those kinds of businesses. So as I see it, I've seen basically every kind of business model there is and sort of what the main drivers are. And then I'm looking to apply those to the entire supply chain of the cannabis sector because as I view it, you know, it's, it's essentially a product. And what you see when you analyze lots of different businesses and it's sort of the actual thing, the widget they're selling matters less than the actual business model of how they sell it or what they do or what the, you know, what the value add is to their, their end customer. Mm. Uh, so that's sort of basically taking the lessons from looking at all these different businesses and, you know, full supply chains from, you know, mining iron ore all the way to, you know, through the auto suppliers all the way to the end, you know, the uh, end auto, auto customers, what have you, and then the financing of those and the dealerships sort of having analyzed, you know, all those, all those pieces in the supply chain, I think I have a good understanding of sort of how different business models, you know, add value or don't add value or what the risk points, the pressure points are on their margins or their sales or, or what have you. I, uh, I've been managing money uh, in a private practice for almost 50 years. And um, I think that what we just listened to for the last six minutes was, one of the reasons why you're on the show is that you have a lot of life experience working at different places, working in different sectors. And what you're doing is you're, you're bringing to the table for us a perspective of a much broader life experience deals with lots of different things that allows you to be better uh, and more thoughtful about when you're doing your analysis now in the cannabis space. So I thank you for that uh, impressive resume and uh, your experience. Um, let's, um, let's, let's move on here. Uh, and let's, let me ask you a question. Um, you mentioned the cannabis space in your, your biography. Um, what attracted you to want to get in this space to start with? Basically it's that I see that, that macro freight train theme. I guess it's a couple things. The first is first, I do see sort of that, uh, you know, that long-term investable thesis, you know, I, I think is quite powerful and, and quite interesting uh, in a sort of like a once in a lifetime opportunity to essentially take what is a, you know, an existing market that's uh, you know, because of the different regulations has, has been uninvestable and can't reach its true potential. Um, that is, I think will inevitably be uh, legalized at some point. And then we'll so there's sort of two legs to that. There's the converting the illicit market to a legal market. And then there's the expansion of use when things are legal versus illegal, just increased consumption and disruption of, you know, um, mm -hmm. alcohol, tobacco, pharma, wellness, you know, huge markets for, you know, for consumers who would not normally use it. They have to like know a guy and get something that they're not quite sure where it's from versus, you know, just getting a regulated product and a nice retail experience. Uh, and the other, you know, and the other, you know, philosophically, the other thing I like about it is, um, you know, just sort of general, I guess, sort of personal, um, guess personal views on, uh, you know, the government regulating people less or not outlawing things uh, and just the general concept that prohibition typically doesn't work. You know, it clearly didn't work with alcohol in the 20s. Um, you know, if adult consumers want to, you know, consume something, there shouldn't be, you know, all these laws, you know, criminalizing that personal choice, especially when they're also, you know, disproportionately applied, uh, which is a whole other, you know, issue with the whole sector in terms of why, you know, it's been illegal and, you know, disproportionately impacting different communities in the country, you know, primarily, you know, uh, people of color have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. So, so removing all that, um, that, that's more the philosophical and social uh, appeal of, of, uh, of legalization. Um, but just from a business standpoint, you know, it, it, like I said, it, it feels like 99 to 2003 mm -hmm. in the Internet from just a purely, you know, pure investment standpoint of, uh, you know, here's a product that, has this huge growth opportunity ahead of it. 
Um, and the one difference versus the internet is that, you know, the internet was kind of a wild card back in 99, 98. Like it, it was not a given that we'd all be buying stuff from Amazon on our cell phones back then. I mean, I remember it. Um, mm-hmm. But with cannabis, you have a proven, you have a proven product. Like there's, you know, a $50 billion market in the U S it's just illegal. <laughs> like this is right. a proven product with proven demand and proven use cases uh, so it actually is less risky than, you know, say, let's say the internet in 1997, 98, you know, when it was just sort of Netscape and, you know, Yahoo trying to like direct you to different things on a ugly little browser and maybe you could buy stuff on it in the future. The pandemic caused a major dislocation in where the opportunities, at least I believe they did, it has, where the opportunities might be going forward. you have any thoughts about that? Uh, well, I, first I agree, and just back at one point you said about it being the Wild West and an appeal to me, I guess I should have said this one, what appeals to me about the industry is that uh, because it's the Wild West and it is sort of complex and it's basically a bunch of micro markets, it's frankly, more fun for me to try to figure out and understand. And, you know, I can add more value as an analyst in that respect, you know, versus um, you know, some other sectors that are publicly traded and heavily covered with perfect information. And, you know, like on, on Ford, am I going to figure out how many F-150s are sold this quarter better than the next guy? Probably not. But in cannabis, can I understand, oh, well, Michigan has this law, but Colorado has that law, but federally, this is what's affecting them both. Uh, yeah, I can add more value in that respect. Um, I guess your point about, um, I guess, COVID, I guess you were saying that uh, you think COVID sort of fundamentally changed the opportunity set. Uh, I guess I'd, I'd be interested to hear, I guess, more on that. As I view it, um, I think sort of any short-term, I guess, dislocation on, I guess I'd have to hear more of what you're saying about, are you talking about different points in the supply chain, sort of physical retail versus delivery versus brands versus cultivation. Cause as I see it, the short term impact I think is more than offset by um, COVID essentially accelerating the long term. Uh, I think the long term path to legalization gets accelerated because of all the turmoil caused by COVID is it is frankly at the end of the day, the government needs now more tax revenue and domestic jobs. And that's something you can get from cannabis. Um, but in terms of, uh, I guess I'd be interested to hear your points on, you know, see if I agree or not on whether cannabis, you know, the COVID has altered, you know, the thoughts of whether you want uh, dispensaries versus cultivation versus brands and the such. Well, I think what we're going to do, what we should do since we're, we're virtually run over time is that we'll, we'll pick up that conversation on your next visit in two weeks. So, um, We've been speaking to Mr. Mike Reagan, who's going to be our new investment guru on uh, America's Cannabis Conversation. And Mike, how can people get in touch with you? You can go over to my website, uh, which is mjresearchco.com. MJR, my initials, and conveniently also stands for marijuana. So uh, I guess it's the Mm -hmm. industry I was born to cover. (laughs) So okay. uh, it's MJ, mjresearchco.com. That has how you can get in contact with me, follow me on Twitter, see the things I'm going to be posting on that website, the articles that I'm still writing as a regular contributor to MJ Biz Daily and uh, anything else, any other you know, platforms where I publish uh, my content. And soon I'll be you know, uh, publishing premium content as well for paying subscribers. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll look forward to an ongoing relationship where you can help educate our consumers. Thank you, sir. Introducing the new Cannabis Electronic Checking Account. Did you know that in 2019, almost one in five dispensaries were either robbed or broken into? Your business is cash only. Because up to now, you didn't have access to a banking account that would allow you to deposit the daily receipts from your business. Some owners have started a banking relationship only to be told in a few months that the institution was closing the account. 
For the first time, you can now have a reliable business checking account. Yes, I said a secure bank electronic checking account. For more information, call 1-888-420-8844 and ask for Dan Perkins. That's 888-420-8884 and ask for Dan Perkins. Welcome back to the conversation. This is Dan Perkins, and joining us today is another one of our guests who's been on before, but she's going to talk about a little different subject today. It's Karen Miller from Cannabis Business Brokers. Welcome to the conversation. Glad to be here again. Thank you. Um, Last time, and our people can go to W420 Radio and listen to your last conversation, you talked about uh, changes in the industry, and I thought we'd spend some time looking at the various elements of the industry and what you as a broker are seeing activity and what somebody who's thinking about getting in the business might want to consider what they're doing before they jump in and buy something. So where, where uh-huh. do you think, it, where's the sweet spot right now in your mind in the cannabis business? I think the most in demand and, um, perhaps ignored area of the industry has been the cultivation side. Um, I see increasing demand for legal grow, as we call it, because Mm -hmm. you you have to remember, and all of this is anecdotal. There are no statistics on this, what I'm going to say. This is anecdotal information based on what people know in the industry. California huge black market in terms of cultivation. How is it possible that in California, the illegal operators are so blatant that they have stores on street corners and sell in the open market? How does that happen? Well, I I think the general answer to that, and principally LA is where the biggest issue is, is that the penalties are too small they make probably 10 or 20 times the penalty in day, some people feel. And right now, there's no jail time. So until the, 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 the consequences of having what we'll call a pop-up shop or an illegal dispensary are dealt with um, more aggressively, I don't see a change. I mean, my understanding is when enforcement goes in and closes a dispensary, in, let's say in L.A., that it's going to reopen someplace nearby now you know landlords involved in this there's uh, i mean it's it's a very frustrating situation for the legal dispensary owners who are paying the high tax rates uh there just needs to be a heavy focus by the city and a will to handle this issue which we have not seen yet I, i don't want to put you on the spot but i based on what you said i have to ask you this question We both know, and most of the people who listen to this show, know that the cannabis business, especially the dispensary business, is an all-cash business. So there's Uh lots lots of money at play. There are places like San Francisco where there are virtually no illegal dispensaries. L.A. is massive, and there's clearly enforcement efforts going on. The sheer size and geography of it, I think, would argue towards the following – Number one, you know, a bigger budget for enforcement so that you can collect all the tax revenue you're not getting, which would mm-hmm. more than pay for the enforcement. And um, just a very, um, you know, steeper penalties, landlords who are fully aware of this, sharing in the penalties, perhaps simply saying, if you're going to let an illegal dispensary be there, the city's going to confiscate the real estate. I mean, there are ways to deal with it. And I think, really, most law enforcement that I talk with, are, like, they, they, they try to, they, they do try their best. It's just such a huge problem because these dispensaries have been around and the people doing this business have been involved in this for, you know, 10, 15 years, 20 years. So you're dealing with something that's fairly entrenched. I heard it. I did an interview with a gentleman not too long ago. Who we were talking about the black market or the dark market, depending on your perspective. And he said they call it the state. traditional market now. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been told name. that's what we're supposed to say. Yeah. Okay. So, so, but what he was saying is that that's Los Angeles 
is a major supplier yes. of cannabis all over the country in the illegal market. Well, right. It, well, well, it's coming from Northern California for the most part. Maybe that's a distribution hub. But, you know, you have an ideal growing climate in places like Mendocino, Humboldt, and Lake Counties. And mm-hmm. that allegedly, again, this is all anecdotal, but uh, we believe <laughs> that that, you know, prior to legalization, certainly in other states, California was supplying the whole country, <laughs> okay. allegedly. I'm not sure what portion of the cannabis was coming, you know, from south of the border, but mm-hmm. certainly the climate for a greenhouse grow or outdoor grow in those regions is absolutely perfect for it. So yeah. it's, and it's a tip, you know, so that is, that is probably the case, but changing because in other states, there's, you know, they do their enforcement, they want to mm-hmm. collect their tax revenue, then there's less of a, uh, uh, it's hard, it, it gets harder and harder for this, this, uh, crop to come in. And, and, and I'd also want to deviate for a second on that. You know, the, the legal cannabis, the restrictions are, are so uh, strict in terms of how you grow it. No pesticides, testing for mold, testing for things that can harm you when you're using the product. Mm-hmm. The black market, it, you know, the product is, they'll put whatever it takes to grow the, pro- the crop quickly pesticides, whatever, it's totally unregulated. So when mm-hmm. you test a lot of the stuff that's on the street, it's not good for you. It's right. cheaper, right. but, you know, it's you're much good. better off going into a dispensary that's regulated by the state. Let me, let me say, I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that you deviated from what we want to talk about. We still have some time, but I think what you did was <laughs> real, really, really helpful to me and hopefully to my audience to understand what's going on. So uh, let's go back to the what's the best right. So I don't recommend this. going into cultivation, even though right now I'm saying I view it as probably the most undervalued area. But what I do, what I would recommend, if someone really wants to go in, then I think you, you enter on the retail side and you either apply for a license, which is getting a little bit harder when you apply for a license because in many of the local jurisdictions, you're competing against large companies who put together these beautiful packages for the politicians to read and you know, talking about how they're going to run it and the compliance, et cetera. It's harder for a, an individual to do that, but it can be done. So you can go that way. Or you come into a market that has been, and I always like to keep saying this, but I'm going to give this as an example, the desert region, I'll call it the greater Palm Springs, desert hot springs region of California. There are lots of dispensaries there. But for that reason, there's a far lower uh, price to enter the industry for someone who'd want to do it and try and learn. And that's, that's the way I would, I would come in. I'd go there or I'd, I'd find an area where, it's just a very low price of entry because this is high risk capital. Right. As a cannabis business broker today in the environment where there's so much disruption, uh-huh. would I be better would I be better off to buy a license from an existing owner than to try and get in line and get something from the state or the city government? Okay. So there are positives and negatives with each. Let me give you the first negative on buying and operating, and then I'll give you the positive on it. You buy an operating business, you have to be extraordinarily thorough in your due diligence and make sure that they filed their tax returns correctly. Because on an earlier show, I talked to you about Section 280E of the Federal Income Tax Code and how you cannot deduct your normal operating expenses. Well, the IRS is auditing. On, an, on a very accelerated basis, dispensaries around the country, particularly in California, and they're getting large checks. There's a big case with a large dispensary in Oakland called Harborside that people could Google and look at the sure. result there to see what I'm talking about. So that is the most important thing to look at because you don't want to buy a business where you, you, you are inheriting liabilities. Uh, and in most states... Or in many states, um, 
you, you can somewhat shield yourself from that pre-existing liability, but not in all. So you have to be very careful. If that issue is not there, then the benefit of buying the ongoing operating business is that you have the customers. And you marketing and bring customers in, very, very important part of any business, particularly in cannabis. Now, if we go to the new licensing front, now you have a clean slate there. So you don't have to worry as much about looking at the history of that business, how they've done their tax returns, um, and, 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 and other things. So, so that's always an advantage, but you're starting from scratch, and you, do, you are going to be competing against people with marketing budgets trying to bring in the same customers. Mm -hmm. But if someone has been in retail and you're committed to giving people a great retail experience and the best product and customer service and running it well, that's, uh, that's, you know, that can be a winning recipe. We've been speaking with Karen Muller, who is the owner of Cannabis Business Brokers. Wonderful, interesting conversation. Thank you much, so much for joining us today on America's Cannabis Conversation. How do people get a hold of you if they want to talk about buying a business? Well, they can uh, contact me at karen at cannabis-brokers.com. That's my email address. They can also go on our website, which is cannabis-brokers.com. Our listings are there, our public listings. We, we also have listing, private listings where owners do not want public marketing. But, um, you know, we discuss those with people um, after we have confidentiality agreements. So I'd look forward to hearing from people. And it's been a pleasure being on the show. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. And we'll be right back. America's newest and fastest-growing cannabis-focused radio network is expanding across the country and looking to add to our sales and marketing team. America's Cannabis Conversation offers listeners insight and information on the exploding world of cannabis. It also gives advertisers the opportunity to reach a hyper-targeted audience, literally neighborhood by neighborhood, in markets all across the country. We're looking for a few motivated individuals that want to essentially run their own local business in markets like Boston, Las Vegas, Reno, Orlando, and more. To learn more about this exciting opportunity or to apply, visit americascannabisconversation.com. Want to find out if cannabis can help your medical condition? It's time to hear from our cannabis doctor on call. Well, California may be growing the best cannabis in the world, but the rest of the world is ahead of even the state of California and much of the USA in its rules, regulations, and access to the wonderful herb. And we're here with Alex Rogers, the CEO and founder of the International Cannabis Business Conference. And you've had conferences in San Francisco, all around the U.S., Canada, Germany, Spain, Switzerland. Why are we so behind the rest of the world, Alex? Oh, man, that is such a good question. And it's kind of tragic. I think it all started off with Cali, like when Colorado legalized first. You know, we were hurt in California. We were like, dang, that should be us. Um, and we had always had de facto legalization in California, you know, under medical auspices. Very robust, very free, very awesome. Some people uh, look to those times of yesteryear, quite look back to yesteryear quite fondly. Um, California clearly had the mo had the biggest, uh, most best black market for cannabis uh, of all time. And unfortunately, that was, it was, uh, those were golden years, actually, for, for some of us. But people were still getting busted. So, so uh, I look at things from a patient perspective and a, and, a, and a user's perspective. So if I can get better weed for a better price and uh, 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 not go to jail for it, that's, that's, that's super important. So, so I'm still happy things have, have, are the way they are. However, I wish that certain things could have been different in terms of getting California out of the black market and and and, and making things flow a little bit uh, uh, better. I, I I honestly think that all the bureaucracy in the California government 
is one of the biggest reasons this 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 hasn't really uh, come to fruition fruition like a lot of people had hoped or imagined. And I just think that that our state is 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 bogged down in savage uh, bureaucracy. And I think that cannabis is uh, what's happened with cannabis and or what's not happened, if you will, is indicative of that. Well, with federal legalization, you know, on the horizon in some people's views, will that be spurred by Canada going, you know, legalized weed? In Portugal and, and other European countries, medical marijuana, legal in Germany, is that going to be an impetus? Because it, it, it's one would imagine that financial influences are going to play a big role in this. Or as Bob Dylan once said, money don't talk, it swears. Yeah, well, money's, money's been the great motivator. I mean, when the recession happened, all of us activists realized that that uh, or a lot of a lot of activists realized, oh, this is our fissure. This is our opening to now push legalization, not for humanitarian, libertarian reasons, uh, uh, but uh, for reasons of uh, economic reasons. And so that, that, is, that always pushed it. That's why we have legalization now, because of the recession. I, I firmly believe that. However, when it comes to the analogy of America federally doing the same because other people around them are doing it, you know, there's two sides of the money here. There's the money made that because it's illegal, and then there's the money that's going to be made when it becomes legal. And I think that pendulum is is starting to shift. That fulcrum is starting to be in the you know the the, the balance is becoming even. Maybe it'll it'll tip to the other side here. When that does, we'll probably federally legalize. However, I don't really think that America is influenced on Canada legalizing or 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 Portugal or any country. I don't think. We really give a f- and uh, and it's and uh, I think we have other things. For example, in Europe, everyone's like, "Oh, we can't legalize and all the UN treaty stuff." In Europe, you talk to people; they're all talking about the UN treaty. You don't hear one person in America talking about one UN treaty. Almost the fact that eighty percent of California's three billion dollar cannabis market in twenty nineteen was black market. Yeah. Wouldn't one imagine that if we had a safe banking act, if we had national legalization, if we had interstate transfer yeah. of cannabis, that you'd make a major dent in that, in addition to bringing the taxes down, the cultivation, uh, the excise taxes well, and the like? Yeah, I mean, of course, the taxes are crazy, but I'm of the ilk that once it becomes uh, nationally legal uh, and, and California can imp- uh, export their product, I really think that that's the saving grace. When Cali can ex- export it, not only to other places in America, but other places in the world. The branding is there. Everybody knows about uh, the Emerald Triangle. You know, Everyone knows about the, the breeders out, out, out in this area, what's been going on for 40 years now. And we're famous for it. And so I, I really have, I have no real hope that the black market is, 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 will be uh, mitigated in any way, shape, or form unless interstate commerce and international uh, cameras, cannabis commerce uh, uh, is allowed. Yeah, one would think that would be the, the number one impetus to it. If you can reduce the black market, you could increase the consumption and sale of legal weed, which would increase your revenues, well, it's a win-win. It's a, that is a no-brainer. And, you know, in terms of tax strategies, if we want to go there, you know, uh, uh, you know, whether you're conservative or liberal or whatever, there's always a sweet spot to tax something. We call it equilibrium, right? So it's going to sell you the most weed and it's going to generate the most revenue. Right now, that's punitive, right? And so it has to lower. And when it does lower... The state's going to generate more revenue. Ain't that something else? So it's counterintuitive to some, but to any basic, any person that studies basic economy, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's a classic win-win. All right, what about the regulation, not the regulation, the testing? California has the most stringent testing, as I understand it, of any in the industry. How about in Europe? in other nations around the world. Do you know the product you're getting is as good as in terms of you it's know not as good in, it's not as good in Europe. Like Germany has medical marijuana um, comes uh, 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 you know it has to be radiated for Christ's sake. So all the European medicine is under uh, 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 GMP practices and has to be uh, just like any any uh, uh, almost any uh, uh, pharmacopoeia uh, uh, substance has to be radiated. The weed, the medical weed in, in Europe is, 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 is just 
you know. So they actually do test it, but and they ra- and they radiate it to kill whatever, you know. I don't know. I think there's always the devil's in the details, right? So they they test it, but then we just saw the scandal with some we coming in from Canada into Europe that you know wasn't tested properly and, and had said it had been and and said, and and, 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 and coming under under un, under those auspices when that actually wasn't wasn't the the case so testing cannabis you know it's a cumbersome thing it's uh it's problematic i actually don't have a solution on that but europe they do they do test it all medical marijuana in germany is sold through pharmacies Mm-hmm. So now you're having these pharmacies in Germany that are actually becoming like de facto dispensaries. Right. It's really cool. But they have to treat that cannabis like any other pharma- pharmacopoeia. And, f- and they also have to mortar and pestilate, which adds cost. So they're actually dealing with a lot of the same that we are. <laughs> Ironically, they're radiating the weed, but they're not allowing GMOs. So in one sense, they've been hypervigilant to keep foods clean and, you know. So Europe is a funny mix of, <laughs> of conservatism and liberalism. You know, we always think Europe's very progressive and liberal, and in one way they are. But they're also a 2,000-year-old society, and, or more, and, uh, uh, you know, within that tradition in, li- in lies a, a certain conservatism also. So I lived in Europe for eight years. I lived all over there. I spend three months a year in Europe now. And uh, I understand the, the culture very well in many different countries. And it is a fascinating mix of, of being open-minded in one way and closed-minded in another. Mm-hmm. The liberal and conservatism that we know in America doesn't, uh, isn't an analog, a direct analog to, to how it's uh, defined in Europe. Yeah, now, sun-grown, Humboldt County, legacy growers, the best of the best, boutique stuff. That's not the case in Europe. This is mostly indoor, correct? That's that's right. I will take Humboldt County over anything I get in Europe, uh, except for we get some good hash in Europe. We get some good Moroccan hash. Yes, I. Yes, I. And my boy just brought me a smoothie. <laughs> now I'm good to go. Uh, like the Tabizla, the King Hassan, the uh, Zero Zero, all those nice creamy Moroccan hashes. That's what I smoke when I'm in Europe, the outdoor uh, uh, hash. Um, but yeah, otherwise... It's all indoor. It's all chemmed out. That being said, you do have some type of organics. You know, you, you can get some organic wheat, but it's like your local home grow guy. You just, yeah. Your buddy, yeah. you know. So, again, I would imagine if it was an opportunity for ca- uh, California's best cannabis to be sold worldwide, it could be an absolute boon. I mean, if it's $3 billion sold in the state and it doesn't cross state line, Look at the I'm potential telling, worldwide. I'm telling you, people don't know. This is the crux to me. This is the crux. And there ain't nothing going to happen in California. I mean, you know, you're going to do, you're gonna do what you're going to do, right? But if it really wants to be something uh, grandiose and special and bombastic and really just keep that legacy, make that legacy go worldwide, import, export. And look, everyone else is doing it to Europe now. Everyone can. Everyone's trying to get their weed to Europe right now, right? When Cali can get their weed to Europe, it's done. People will choose the California weed over the other stuff. So I can't, you know, I can't stress this enough how, how important it is that this policy uh, uh, changes. I think it's more important than banking or tax regulation, actually. We, I mean, obviously the two uh, very well could correlate or go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, people don't know how important it is. There, there is a solution. There's an easy, quick solution, and that's it. Yeah, so meanwhile, with so many businesses going out of business, if you could hang in there and be a little patient, That's right. maybe uh, there is a pot of great gold at the end of the rainbow. Yeah, there is the pot. You know, it's, it's, it, you know, it's being, shit's being weeded out, no pun intended, but it truly is the, uh, uh, I mean, it's a great point. You've got to hang in there. And that, that's kind of business in general is... You know, you got your, it's, it's, you know, who, who are the entrepreneurs that are going to make it? It's not necessarily the smartest, you know, it's the hardest working and the most resilient people. Alex, you've been great. The CEO and founder of the International Cannabis Business Conference. He's worldwide. He's the man, Alex Rogers, with Rich Walkoff on the W420 Radio Network.
thank you for taking part in America's Cannabis Conversation. To hear this show in its entirety or to hear any of our archive shows, log on to americascannabisconversation.com and tune in next Saturday at 4.20 p.m. for the next installment of America's Cannabis Conversation.